So hello everybody, uh, welcome, thank you for joining us for this evening's Monday at the Mess talk, which is Drimna, a history. Uh, and Mondays at the Mess, if you haven't been before, it's a series of talks uh, that we run from Richmond Barracks in Intracore that celebrates kind of the local area and local histories, uh, the very rich stories and experiences of the local community past and present. And it's very important to us that the Barracks uh, is part of its, of its community. Richmond Barracks is run by Dublin City Council Culture Company, uh, who run cultural initiatives and buildings across the city, like 14 Henrietta Street, uh, with and for the people of Dublin. My name is Donald Fallon. Uh, I work with Dublin City Council Culture Company. And in a few minutes, I'm going to hand you over to tonight's speaker, Cathy Scuffle. But before we do that, uh, I want to let you know there'll be time at the end for some questions. So, you know, if you have questions, pop them into the chat box uh, during the during the lecture and at the end, I'll get as many of them to Cathy uh, as we can and we'll do our best uh, to get through them all. So the talk is being recorded. Uh, so if you're sitting there taking notes, fear not, it will go up uh, online. We'll share it at a later date on, on YouTube and all the other channels. So uh, if you want to be told when that will be, sign up to the newsletter uh, and we'll put the link for that up in the chat as well. Our speaker today needs no introduction. If you're here, you definitely know her, Cathy Scuffle. Uh, Dublin City Council historian in residence for both Dublin South Central and the South East uh, area, uh, a woman who knows the history, the social history of that corner of Dublin and the city really in its entirety better than anyone from weaving in the liberties to the history of the Dolphins Barn brickworks. Uh, her knowledge of the history of people uh, in Dublin is extraordinary. Her master's thesis was published by Four Courts Press as the South Circular Road uh, on the eve of the First World War, and that received a very deserved medal uh, from the Old Dublin Society in 2018. Uh, very actively involved in commemorations uh, across the city in this decade of centenaries, and works as a consultant historian as well. I don't know how many hours in your day, Cathy, definitely more than 24. <laughs> you, managed to do, you managed to do so much, I don't know how you do so much, uh, as well as working as one of the City Council's historians uh, in residence. So there is not a part of Dublin uh, on this beyond the canals on the on the south side anyway that Cathy doesn't know inside out uh, and today we're going to get what I'm sure will be a, a very intriguing history uh, of Drimna the bricks and mortar and the people as well so I'm going to mute myself turn off my camera I'll leave you with Cathy and as you have questions throw them in the chat box and we shall get to them in Lovely. Thanks a million, Donald, for that lovely introduction. And if you can just bear with me, everybody, until I just share my screen and we get this talk underway tonight. Um, you're all very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and sure, like all talks, we'll have a little bit of fun uh, working our way through the history of Drimna. And I am honoured to be part of the Mondays at the Mess series again. Uh, it's always a lovely thing to be part of. Sorry, we can't be there in person, but we all know the reasons for that and we won't mention it. Uh, yes, I am the historian in residence for D Dublin South, uh, City Council, working in the South Central and the South East areas. It's my honour to work in those areas. And it, it's just so interesting, so many different communities and when you take each individual one and then put them together as a whole, we get a lovely sense of the history of uh, Dublin. And Drimna itself has its own history. So let's get things underway. For those of us who don't know Drimna, and I'm sure there might be some here tonight who don't, let's have a look at it. A, a, a slightly hazed out overall image here of Drimna. Just a few little points about it. Uh, located on the south side of Dublin as we head west. Um, has four stations on the Lewis. How is that? Not many areas can actually boast that. So Shore Road, um, Golden Bridge, Drimna itself and Black Horse are all part of the whole Drimna complex. So they're the, the four Lewis stations that Drimna has. Um, it is a city suburb, slowly developed more or less onwards from 1930s or thereabouts, but very much during the 1940s it began its life as the Drimna we know today. It's home to generations of Dubliners. Uh, so many people will trace their roots back to Drimna and do it with a certain amount of well-justified pride. And um, if you look at this image, it, it might vaguely resemble something. And, um, you know, this is its aerial view. And sure, I tell you what, we'll come back to that 
a little later on. So just hold that thought in your head. We're looking at an overall image of Drimna there. It is meant to represent something. I'll explain it to you uh, towards the end of the talk um, as, as we look, uh, look, as we work our way through the story of Drimna itself. It got its Catholic Church in 1943, and that was, of course, a major development towards creating a community uh, that built up around uh, Drimna itself. And of course, the schools itself, they, they too were built in the 1940s. And when we look at the schools in the Drimna area, believe it or not, they're very appropriate to now, because they were built at a time when Dublin was going through the TB crisis. So those schools were built with two things in mind, plenty of ventilation, cross ventilation within the school buildings and also a reinforced roof because if you remember in the 1940s there was a threat of air raids in Dublin and the one thing they feared was that a bomb would land on a school building so the schools in Drimmer were built with that in mind so again when we look at around us in the area of Drimmer itself we can find elements of it reacting to the times that it was in. So Drimna, let's look at a few of the place names that are associated with the area. Drimna itself is quite interesting. In fact, all of the roads there represent the Dublin Mountains, which is quite an interesting project in itself. If you want children to learn a little bit of their geography, hand them a map of Drimna, keep them occupied for a couple of hours as they work out the mountains of Ireland. But there's more to it than that. If we know our Dublin and we go, say, beyond the Walkinstown roundabout, we go into an area called the Green Hills. And of course, that's where the Dublin mountains are tapering into the gentle Green Hills. You go from the mountain range down into the Green Hills. Beyond that, the Green Hills themselves stretched out into sandy ridges. And it's from the sandy ridges that we get the name Drimna itself, Drumnock. Is it a scalga, meaning sandy ridge? The other little townlands or areas that we have close by are Bluebell. That it, 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 it's one of these movable feasts, Drimna. So parts of Bluebell were actually parts of Drimna. Parts of Walkinstown were formerly parts of Drimna as well. And Crumlin itself, that name, another one of our old Celtic names, Crumglinna or Crooked Glen, takes its name from the Lansdowne Valley. And as we well know, the Lansdowne Valley goes right through Drimna itself. At the other end, of course, it's bordered by Rialto. The Grand Canal forms the boundary then mostly to the north of Drimna and cuts it away from the Inchicora area. And of course, along from the Grand Canal, we get Herberton Road, the Crumlin Road, and back up to the Lansdowne Valley where the Camac River flows. And uh, when I say we have a moving Drimna, we certainly do have a moving Drimna. It's because it has been called Drimna at different points at different times. I have a nice image here, which I got from Dublin City Library and Archive. And this is an old image of Davit Road before the Lewis went in. Um, and it's the Grand Canal stretching off into the distance towards Black Horse Bridge. Uh, I can remember that walk on a, a many a bleak day walking up along the canal. It always felt so wide and always seemed to be a bad weather day when I was walking along it. But you can see there some of the older developments and only one car on Taffet Road. Imagine that today. Very hard to imagine it. And they managed to fit the Lewis tracks right on the banks of the Grand Canal at that point. So you can see it in its former times and then as we know how it's developed more recently. And believe it or not too, our Drimna got mentioned in Joyce. So if we're looking at Ithaca in Ulysses, um, here is a quote from uh, Ulysses, uh, and it actually mentions some places that would be reasonably familiar to people who might be who might know in and around the Drimna area. So you can see there they're mentioning places like Longwood Avenue and Leonard's Corner, and um, also uh, Sing Street and Bloomfield Avenue. But he, the, the key pieces are at the end of that quote where they talk about Gibraltar Villa and Bloomfield House in Crumlin. Gibraltar Villa, for anybody who knows the area quite well, if you know where Securicore 
is at the moment near Herberton Bridge. That's where Gibraltar Villa was formerly. So as you can see, a little bit of Drimna found its way into Ulysses and Bloomfield House then was located further up the Crumlin Road itself. So it's just nice to know we're part of the big literary world as well as anything else. And these little things are worth rooting out because they're part of our actual story. But where did Drimna begin? Like the sandy ridges would locate it closer to Green Hills. So if we move up in the Green Hills direction, this is where we actually find the real roots of Drimna. And this is an image of it. The original Drimna Tulis. Anybody who knows Walkinstown Avenue will know of the park on Walkinstown Avenue. And you know that undulating uh, landscape that it has in the park at that point. That's part of the original tumulus for Drimna. It was the end of the Green Hills and the beginning of the Sandy Ridges. Now, this tumulus was quite important. Um, it's, it was a very, very impressive burial mound. And we know it was a burial mound because a funereal bowl was actually found in the mound. And that is in the National Museum today. Now, obviously, you can see here that a, a lot of the mound had been removed. In fact, it was being used for building materials for a lot of generations in the general area. And you even find people today talking about the sand pits. Um, so the sand pits would have been generally around green hills. And this was part of it. But this is the best image I could find of the original tumulus that was the Drimna tumulus. And it's from that that we actually get the name of the suburb that we know today. Drimna moves and it moves with its history. But that's the roots of Drimna on the Walkinstown Avenue in Dublin. One of those little quirks that we often get in our Dublin city. And then if we just look at the map then where we find the name Drimna being used for different buildings. And you can see very, very clearly there, Drimna Castle. Now, most people will know that as the boys' school on the Long Mile Road. Um, you can see in behind it the Drimna paper mill and there's a Drimna cottage. So here we find Drimna moving from the Walkinstown Avenue further down the Long Mile Road and the name being used here. And of course, that's part of the real history of Drimna, where it moves from the Drimna tumulus down to the castle. This brings us into our Norman history. Drimna Castle itself relates back to Strombo. Everything seems in Dublin relates back to Strombo somehow. But he takes the land from the Celtic Irish and he gives it to the Barnwall family. And Hugh de Barnwall, of course, is closely associated with the construction of Drimna Castle. One of a number of defences around the city of Dublin to protect the Norman stronghold on the outer reaches. So you built a castle with narrow windows that it was an actual protection of the city. Um, and it was on the outskirts. And in return, you were given land and opportunity. And you can see one of the opportunities is the fact that there was a water supply near Drimna Castle. And this allowed, as time went on, for it to be used as a power supply as well as a water supply. So a branch of the Kalmuk River uh, called the Bluebell River at this point, becomes part of the castle network and then eventually turns into a mill race for the, uh, to power the mills behind the castle and others in the area. If I just bring you up into 1837, this is a great um, source to have. It's Samuel Lewis's Topography uh, Dictionary of Ireland. Now, this was gathered from local clergymen and people in, in, in authority or in control of particular areas. And they were asked to submit a description of their parish. And this is the description of Drimna submitted in 1837. You can see two spellings of Drimna there, kind of a slight um, anglification. So we have the Drimna that we know ourselves, G-R-I-M-N-A-G-H, or Drimna Anna. So um, it's just to show that it can be spelled different ways. Here we are in the Barony of Upper Cross in Dublin, two miles west southwest from Dublin, on the road to Nace, as we know, the Long Mile Road, um, and on the Grand Canal. So it's those lands between the two that we're interested in here. 
the ancient parish of Drimna had by 1837 been merged into the parish of Clondalkin. So Clondalkin would have had references or uh, records that related to the Drimna area uh, held out there. You notice too that the paper mill is mentioned there at the Lansdowne Valley. Now I'd shown you that on the map in the previous slide. And it does mention too that nearby was the Bluebell Woolen Factory uh, where coarse cloths were manufactured in 1837. Uh, that's what it was. Later on, it became the Camock Mills. So the Camock Mills were quite important in that general area. All the remains of the Camock Mills today is a small industrial estate. But if you look closely at the gateposts as you're going into that industrial estate, you'll see Camock written on them. It also refers, Lewis also refers in 1837 to our Drimna Castle, and he mentions that the barn walls were the lords uh, of there from King John to James I. Um, and then later, it's the property of the Marquis of Lansdowne, and that shows you that's where we get Lansdowne Valley. He also mentions that the church, as the original Drimna church, was in Rome. And again, just to show that on the map, you can see here um, the Drimna Castle, the paper mills, and there is the woolen factory from Bluebell shown quite nicely there in the top left hand corner of the image. Again, this would be um, the old Nace Road or the Nace Road heading down towards the canal, which is slightly off the image here. But again, it's just nice to put the whole dimensions and the, the entire area in context when we're trying to imagine what Drimna was like in the past before it was the Drimna that we have today. And here are two nice images that John took for me of Drimna Castle as it is today, and also of Bluebell Cemetery, which of course contains the runes, those runes that are mentioned in Lewis's topography of the uh, Drimna Church. That's the original Drimna Church located in what we call today Bluebell Cemetery. Later on, Lord Lansdowne, I think around in 1905, gave the grounds beside the church and towards the river as the new cemetery. So that would be the cemetery that we know today, but it was in the past an original burial ground uh, concentrated around the ruins of the original Drimna church. Uh, Drimna is an example of having a castle in one location and the church much further away. Uh, not so say in Ballyfermot where we had the castle church and graveyard all together, they, that, the ruins of which would be under the Lawns Park in uh, Ballyfermot. So uh, Driven is an example of it being scattered over a much broader area. Hard for us to imagine it today with all the industrial estates and the busy roads that intersect, but at one time they were just open fields linking the ruined church or the old church of Driven with the castle itself, all part of the one complex. Now, during the castle, just a couple of things on it. So not the school, we're talking about the old castle in the grounds there. It is a, a well-known Irish castle, has a flooded moat from the Camac tributary, the Blue Bell River. In fact, it is the only castle in Ireland that has its complete moat, which makes it a little bit special. And has been the home of the Barnwell family um, pretty much for about 600 years or thereabouts. Very important uh, family. You find Barnwall as a surname all over County Dublin still. So huge connections with that Norman family. Did a check in the 1901 census and by then it was in the um, hands of Councillor Joseph Hatch, who was a dairy man, but he had a home on Lisa Street. Drimna was his country home, would you believe it or not? And he used it for grazing the area around there. Later on, it became the Christian Brothers Schools, and it has gone through a number of restorations over the years, and it's quite famously been used as a film set as well. So we've quite a lot going on in Drimna, and it's because it has more or less kept its shape and its image, where sadly Ballyfermot has lost its castle, Drimna still has it preserved in the grounds of the Christian Brothers schools there on the Long Mile Road. And a couple of older images of it, quite evocative really, I suppose, for this time of the year, it's just wonderful to see a castle depicted like this. Um, there's a great image of the moat going along the side of the castle, and you can see steps leading from the moat. So obviously, 
a way of bringing things into the castle by boat. Uh, you would bring them around the moat and up the back stairs here. Those stairs are still there. It's just conscious of a whole image that you would never imagine in this part of Dublin. And then, of course, this is a picture of it in 1841. So this would be pretty much the castle that Samuel Lewis was describing in the topography that we read from earlier on. So again, you can see it's slightly in ruin, but certainly you would recognize it as the castle that we have today. And then of course, I did mention it had gone through restoration, it went through a major one in, in 1986. Um, it seemed to go on for quite some time, but this was a huge uh, restoration project of its time. And you see the detail and the effort that they went through to restore the stonework, particularly around the doorways. And they had great uh, something really good to work with from the very beginning, because the castle itself was in really good condition. And there were certain things that needed to be preserved and kept and updated and restored. Uh, one of the things they definitely did was put in the beautiful um, roof back into the Great Hall at the top of the, uh, the castle too. And also the grounds around it were restored at this time as well. And those of you who have gone to Specsavers will zoom in on this picture here and you'll be able to see uh, one of our Lord Mayors in this image. There's Bertie Ahern inspecting the restoration of Drimna Castle. Got these images from the Dublin City Library and Archive. But you can see the amount of work they had to do at the roof level of the castle. And I mean, certainly that masonry, the scaffolding, it certainly conjures up an image of a lot of work to be done, but thankfully they did it in the 80s and it stands now today as a restored castle. And we're very, very lucky to have it as a remnant of Drimna's really important past. So sometimes you find little gems like these when, when you're going to the archive. I was delighted to find this particular one. Of course, uh, no self-respecting castle would be uh, 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 in situ in Dublin unless it had a good ghost story. And of course, the, the good ghost story is about the Lady Eleonora. Now, I'm not talking about the pub, uh, which is located on the Drimna Road, but there's a reason why that pub is called Eleonora's. And it's all to do with Lady Eleonora de Barnwall, who was... Um, uh, affianced to her cousin, Edmund Barnwall. Now, Eleanor's claim to fame is none other than she was a maid, a bride, and a widow, all in one day. Now, that's a lot of hard work to pack into one day, and that's why we still commemorate Eleanor in the Drimna area. She is. She leaves Drimna Castle, a big cavalcade, makes its way in towards Pastors Cathedral as the bells are pealing to greet the bride on her wedding day. And her husband-to-be, Edmund, is there. The wedding goes ahead and they are returning to Drimna uh, for the reception afterwards. Somewhere along the route, I like to think it might have been around Dolphin's Barn, but that's just me being a person from Dolphin's Barn, liking to lay a little claim to the story herself. But somewhere along the route, the entire wedding party is attacked by Sean O'Byrne from the Dublin Mountains and a few of his pals. There's a huge battle in Suze, and in the battle, Edmund Barnwall is killed, making Eleonora a widow. Now, why did Sean attack the wedding party as it returned to Drimna? Well, let's say when they got back to Drimna Castle, Eleonora had quite a lot of explaining to do because she was the reason that the wedding party was attacked. Herself and Sean had a little liaison going on and Sean decided that he'd move on the wedding party. Uh, there's an almighty row in the castle, needless to say, after the, uh, the attack and after the whole incident on the way home. And Eleanor is being kept in captivity in the castle, but she does manage to get out. She disappears. There's a massive search for her. Three days later, she's found in the Valley of Glenness Mole, because unknown to her, Sean O'Byrne had also been injured in the incident as the wedding party returned and Sean dies of wounds. She finds the freshly dug grave for Sean O'Byrne in the Valley of Glenness Mole. And it was on that grave that Eleonora was discovered a few days later. She died from exposure in the Valley of Glenness Mole. 
it's said she haunts Drimna Castle to this day. And I'm not one to debunk any good ghost story, especially the day after Halloween. This is show you what we mean about the way they engineered the water in and around Drimna Castle. And this is a fantastic shot of the weir at the back of Drimna Castle, where those new apartments are near Lansdowne Valley. It's a little bit difficult to get this image, and I'm, I'm just delighted that John makes a huge effort to take photographs for me. But this is a, an image of that weir at the back of the, uh, of the apartments. If you get the opportunity to walk around the back of the Lansdowne Valley apartments, you can hear the water rushing through. And this, of course, was the power source for the Drimna paper mills for many years. And it would have been part of the economy of the castle and the general Drimna area for, for many, many years. And it's part of the mill race. You can also see that there's a divide there in the, in the water. These are called stone boats. And this was to manage the mill race. So there was other sources of water moving on down into the Lansdowne Valley fascinating to uncover these little hidden sites that are so near where we all live and just take the effort to go for a walk and try and find out and interpret the area that you're from and understand why these things were hugely important in the past. A huge employer, the Drimna paper mills, very important to the area and the reason why people settled in that area over the years and the way people can trace their roots back. So if you come across a family member in the censuses working in the paper mills, it may not have been Colleen in Clondalk and they were working in, it could have been Drimna. So that just opens up another opportunity for you to see if you can find something else about them. And of course, no one can tell the story of Drimna without mentioning this man. And this is Alderman Michael Flanagan. Now, Alderman Flanagan lived in Rialto in Port Mahan House, but the lands of Port Mahan stretched all the way up along the canal towards Drimna. In fact, he had Port Mahan Lodge also in the Drimna area long before Drimna was built. Uh, Alderman Flanagan's originally from Green Hills himself. Uh, that's where he grew up. And in later years, he marries a lady from Crumlin. They settle in um, Rialto and raise a really large family there, one of whom was the Bird Flanagan, um, the very famous son. And that's a whole presentation for another night. But when I mention Alderman Flanagan, I have a reason for doing that, because if we move up the Crumlin Road, we can find out a few more connections with them. And one of them this will give you an idea of the extent of the land that he had. This is stretching all along the canal um, and around the whole Rialto area. And you can see it almost goes up as far as Drimna Cottage. You remember that from the earlier map. So all along the Crumlin Road, stretching right back into uh, the Drimna area as we know it. And there's an interesting house marked on the map there, a little bit hard to see, but it's called Leicester House. And of course, this is one of the houses that Alderman Flanagan owned in the area. Again, when I went digging on the city archive, I managed to find this old image taken from the Billy Mooney connection, uh, collection that's there in the archive of Leicester House, located on the Crumlin Drimna Road. Um, would have been very close to where we know Errigal Road today on the corner, uh, but you can see it in this image, it is quite in ruin. So this is just before it was demolished in the 1970s. Uh, you can date it from the car that's parked there in the front. Um, but wasn't it a beautiful house, you know, lovely um, Georgian uh, fan light and quite a number of bays in the house itself, quite an important uh, building on the Crumlin Drimna Road. And of course, what's there today, of course, is our Lady's Hospital. Now, this is where we get this moving Drimna again. It goes by Our Lady's Children's Hospital, Crumlin. And that is technically correct because at the time it was built, the area that it was built in was known as Crumlin North. And that is another old name. So it's Drimna moving from the castle area down the road, down towards Crumlin and into the area that we know today. And that's when it became known as Drimna. So another one of these little mix ups that we get, uh, Our Lady's Crumlin Hospital is in Drimna. 
uh, in the Drimna that we know today. So it's just another little interesting uh, story. But the hospital was built on the grounds of Leicester House, which had been formerly owned by Alderman Flanagan from Rialto. Another little thing about Leicester House, the stables of the house uh, survive today and have been converted into new into houses and they are located a little bit further up the Drimna Road as we're heading in the direction of Drimna Castle itself. It wouldn't be quite as far as opposite the Eleonora, but along that route there, a group of houses and today um, their homes uh, previously were the stables of Leicester House. Now, another place name that we have associated with Drimna, of course, is Brickfields, or the Brickers, as everybody knows it locally. Fantastic park. Um, it, it, for me, was a godsend during lockdown, place that you could go do two laps of it. You met so many people, everybody out walking the dog. A wonderful, wonderful facility to have right in the centre of Drimna itself. But why is it called Brickfield? Park, uh, an unusual name to find in the middle of the estate, but of course the clue is in the name. This was part of the Dolphins Barn Brick Works. In fact, it was the area so intensively dug out that the ground was unstable and considered inappropriate for building houses on. It had been dug out so much to get that really valuable brick clay to make the Dolphins Farm brick that they turned it into a park. Similar happened on Sundrive Road with the Eamon Cant Park that we have there, or Sundrive Park. Again, that had been an area dug out for brick clay to make, make the Mount Argus bricks, who were also part of the Dolphins Farm brick company have an old, old establishment document which appeared in the newspapers when they set up the Dolphins Barn uh, Brick Company, detailing the way the shares were going to be uh, handed out and managed. And you can see that they called on the assistance of people from the Aston Hall Brick Company in, the, in Britain. Um, and there was also other people involved, including um, J, J. Bud Doyle, who was to be the director of the, um, the actual brick company, but he was closely associated with Todd Burns and Company. Todd Burns building, today we all know it as Pennies and Mary Street. So that building in Mary Street has a close association with the man who was the director of the Dolphins Barn Brick Company on the Crumlin Road, which actually the entire lands of it went right back into Drimna itself. Very hard to get uh, documents and information about the brick company, but this was one great find, great day of excitement when I came across it in the archive when I was researching the brick company itself. But what are dolphins barn brick? I mean, some people may not have seen them. Well, here they are. They're kind of a brick, uh, a, a biscuit coloured brick. That's the best way to describe them. Sometimes they can nearly be black. Um, some bricks that you find in a set of them may end up nearly being a black colour. And of course, that was all to do with the type of brick clay that they were digging out in the area. So although they're called Dolphin's Barn, they're actually dug out in Drimna. So this is somewhere that Drimna has lost out on and Dolphin's Barn has gained on. But of course, at that time, the lands that went as far as what we call Brickfield Drive today were in Dolphins Barn and in fact today they're still in Dolphins Barn Parish so it's it's just one of those mix-ups again that we get in history. Dolphins Barn Bricks really built our city because the brickworks were in operation from the late 1890s all the way through to the 1940s and there was intensive building uh, took place in our city at the time so they turn up just about everywhere couple of really good stories about them and they they use the canal company extensively to move the bricks around so you find the bricks turning up in places like Athai or even Mullingar and um, where they have been used for building various buildings as far as I remember an extension to Mullingar Cathedral is actually built with Dolphins Barn Brick themselves it was a thriving company and a huge employer in the area but it also had political connections. 
the manager of the brick company during the 1916 era, a revolutionary time, was a man called Peter Cassidy, and he had close associations with the Republican movement. And he allowed the brickworks be used for training purposes for Nafina boys. It was also used as an arms dump during the rising. And it is the place to where James Connolly was brought. When you read the story of James Connolly, he goes missing for three days before the Easter rising. Some accounts suggest that he had been brought out to Lucan, but most accounts agree that he was actually brought to the Dolphins Barn Brickworks on the Crumlin Road, where they talked him into taking part in the Easter Rising and bringing his citizens army with them. So it's just a wonderful connection that we have to the 1916 Rising with the Dolphins Barn Brick Company located on the Crumlin Road, stretching right back across Strimna and into the area that we know as the Brickfields Park today. A huge link with our history, a local story that has the national and international connection. You find a various number of references to it being used as a uh, arms dump, for example. Uh, there's a good one there from Christopher Byrne talking about having um, a, an arms dump in uh, the Brickworks at Dolphins Barn. Miss Flood's house at Bluebell, that pops up a few times. Uh, the Floods were huge supporters of St. Patrick's Athletic, for example, in Inchcore, and they allowed their land on the Crumlin Road, roughly um, a little bit further down from the castle. Their lands were located uh, out nearer the uh, Nace Road, um, but they allowed their land be used for um, uh, for the Republican movement, but they also allowed their lands be used for St. Patrick's Athletic when they needed a football pitch. Another quote there that we have um, that the, the brickworks at the second block uh, along by the bridge, and they had another depot in the Oblate Church in, in Shikor. You can just see it turning up again and again, mentions of the brickworks as part of the support network for the 1960 rising and onwards into the War of Independence. Here during the War of Independence, again, they mention they use the brickworks as a landmark on the Crumlin Road. Uh, and this is an account of the destruction of some of the military uh, vehicles. They hijacked them outside the brickworks. And uh, a couple of them were actually brought out to the mountains and destroyed. In fact, they were brought out to Glencree. There was a quarry in Glencree, where the German cemetery ironically is today. And that's where the, uh, the military uh, trucks were actually brought out there. Um, so they were hijacked on the Crumlin Road. Why would this happen on the Crumlin Road? Well, it was quite easy to think this was the route out to Baldonnell. And of course, that's where the auxiliaries and some of the Black Towns were located. Baldonnell was under construction at the time, and it was the area outside. So they were bringing workmen back and forth along the Crumlin Road. And of course, it was an easy target on the Crumlin Road itself. And the only landmark you had along the route at the time were the brickworks. And you can see it quite clearly there uh, marked on the map, brickworks and the clay pits beyond. And of course, this brings us to the story of the halfway house. Now, if you knew the Eleanor, you're going to know the halfway house a little bit further up the road. And of course, this was another landmark along the route out towards Baldonnell. And again, one of the landmarks marking the boundary around our Drimna. And of course, the inevitable happened during the War of Independence. In fact, just over 100 years ago uh, this year, it happened in May 1921, the uh, halfway house was destroyed by the Black and Tans in retaliation for partly for the hijacking of those military vehicles I showed you a few moments ago. But then later on, there had been a number of ambushes along the Long Mile Road near Drimna Castle, and they used the halfway as a way of concealing themselves for the ambushes and also for as a getaway. I love this particular image. Uh, you see the crowds have gathered, all the people have come down from Valley Mountain around Inchicore, up from Drimna to see all that remains of a splendid house. Um, 
Here's our local RIC man, obviously he's trying to take control of the whole situation and he hasn't noticed the young lad uh, making his way around the back of the pub. Um, well, the local tradition has it that some of the cottages on the Ballymount Road that have tiled pathways up to their hall doors, well, those tiles have come from the floor of the destroyed halfway house during the War of Independence. How else can we explain tiled pathways leading up to cottages in Ballymount that were not there before 1921? Another image that I took from Fanula Watchhorn's excellent book, Crumlin and the Way, is what it was, a book that I have referenced extensively for this talk, uh, again shows that after they started clearing it out, thankfully the pub was restored. And because it was restored, that's how we have it in its current uh, condition. They faithfully rebuilt it. Um, it remained uh, passed from the Conway family to the Yates family. They were actually um, nephews of the Conways. And it was in the Yates family for up to very recent times. Um, but it's a, an important landmark in the area in connection with the War of Independence, probably the single biggest event to take place um, and a landmark that features in a number of different incidents over the years. Now, we have mentioned the brickworks a couple of times. Um, and again, just to place it properly, if anybody knows the Loretto schools, and you know the Sun Drive Road uh, Garda Station and the Crumlin Shopping Centre, what remains of it today, the Crumlin Shopping Centre would actually be the location of the brickworks itself. But the lands associated with it stretch much further beyond that across to Drimna. Um, the buildings are very clearly shown here on a image that I managed to get from Britain from above. I often wonder why Britain was taking photographs from above uh, of Ireland during the 1940s, but they certainly took photographs of the what was then the turning from the Dolphus Barn Brickworks into the Maracrete uh, company. But it's a great image because at the bottom left-hand corner, we can clearly see the Loretto Schools complex. We see the dark lanes or Sun Drive Road here. We can see the old county road, which is exactly what it was, the original county road leading out from Dublin. And of course, the Crumlin Road, which was built at a later date as a more direct route. And there's the extensive workings of the brickworks and later the Marcrete. The area you could see off the distance is that really heavily worked um, brick fields. You can make out the ridges. This has been extensively quarried for brick clay. And of course, that's the location of our brick fields park. It's just wonderful to find an image like this, which allows us to be transported back. But look what's happening at this time. Drimna is starting to be built. And there's the first keyhole on uh, Keeper Road as you make your way up towards the Brickfields Park. So Drimna, the building of Drimna is beginning with these houses that back onto what was formerly the Brickworks. Now the brickworks, everything didn't always go swimmingly, and often I, I find it difficult to get images of buildings, and the only times you'll get the images is if something has happened, and this is one occasion when they all went out and strike. What's really interesting about this picture, here they are, uh, picketing the gate into the brickworks. There's a couple of Gardaí on duty, so we know this is in the 1930s or thereabouts, but look, there are women as well as men employed in the brickworks. And this is what was significant about it. It nearly had an equal number of men and women working because the skills that were involved in making handmade bricks transferred easily between both genders. A great little image because it shows us that as our country struggled for independence and got through to the free state era, we had problems trying to keep people in work, trying to keep our economy going, and somehow we managed to do it. But this is an example of a strike up in the Dolphins Barn Brickworks. Um, the problem with the brickworks is it's often marked as the Dublin Brickworks in Crumlin. Of course, the Dublin brick was also made by the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. 
So that's an image of some of the buildings that we can see associated with the brickworks. Have another one that I found in the city archive, and you can see the temporary nature of some of the sheds that would be being uh, built to work the brickworks or the concrete company that was there later. Um, there would have been temporary shelters, temporary buildings, and then they would be easily demolished and moved to another location. But this is another one that's in the collection in the archive. But where do we find the bricks? Well, you sometimes now you find them in museums. I know the little museum of Dublin has one on the shelf. If you had a close look at my back garden, you'll find a few of them as well, because it's something that I love to get and people know that they will give me a, a brick and, you know, that I have it as part of my collection. But this has to be my favourite little wall in Dublin and it's located on Brickfield Drive and the Crumlin Road, quite near the, um, the college on the Crumlin Road. And as you can see, it's a little Dolphus Barn brick wall, probably the most associated um, and most appropriate monument that we could have in this area. Now, again, those of you who went to Specsavers will notice there's something going on with this particular brick. So I got John to turn the image upside down and we can see here, DBC is written on those bricks. That stands for the Dublin Brick Company, which we mentioned previously in the earlier slide. They would put that name on the fancier bricks that they were making. You see these ones are angled for the top of the wall. I said it before, I'll say it again. If that wall is ever touched, damaged or demolished, would somebody please give me a ring because I want to be on the spot. It is probably the most appropriate little monument that we have to a former very significant company that existed in our area, a huge employer and part of the local story and very much part of Drimna's story, very appropriate to Drimna. And a lot of people had very close associations with the brickworks. Certainly I did a trial for 1911 and the number of people working in the brickworks in the area at the time was really quite outstanding. So it's one of those things that's very much part of the world that we live in. So that little wall on the Crumlin Road is important for all of us as part of our heritage. But where will we find the bricks maybe in uh, the area? Well, this is a wonderful line of houses on Morn Road and they're right in the middle of the Drimnet development. These are the final houses to be built using Dolphin's Barn Brick and how appropriate that they're built in Drimna because it was the compulsory purchase of the Dublin and Dolphin's Barn Brick Company lands that gave us the site for Drimna in the 1940s and the very, very last bricks to be used in public housing with those, this particular terrace of houses along Morn Road. There are a couple of houses on Galtimore Road as well that have the Dolphins Barn Brick. And you can see what I mean about some of the bricks appearing slightly black in colour. This is what gives them this lovely speckled image. Um, and these are the final Dolphins Barn Bricks to be used to build houses on the site that was compulsory purchased from the Dolphins Barn Brick Company, effectively putting the brick company out of business to build houses for the people of Dublin. A lovely line of houses that we have on Morn Road. I might actually have, yeah, I have a little closer image of them again. You can see them there, the lovely um, brick effect. Very outstanding line of houses on Morn Road. Not the only thing that we have associated with the brick company, I'm going to bring you back to the Crumlin Road for a minute, uh, backing onto our Drimna, you'll have all recognised these two, there's two plaques on the Crumlin Road, Mara Crete Costas. This is the first lot to be built in the late in the 1930s. There's another group that were built in the 1950s and they were built for the workers of the concrete company that relocated to the Dolphins Barn Brick Company. It kept reinventing itself as uh, building practices change. So the Morocrete, which stood for Moran Concrete, um, they existed on that site till 1975 when the shopping centre was actually built on the original 
uh, site of Morrow Creek Cottages. Anybody walking past those houses, I always challenge you to have a look at the gap between the line of houses. Very hard to get a photograph of it, but you can actually see um, the sign Morrow Creek painted on the gable wall of one of those houses. Uh, they specialised in all sorts of concrete products, including paving slabs, uh, light fittings, um, and big, big, large pipes for the new drainage systems that we are putting in in Dublin, but also those lovely speckled concrete blocks that we find all over uh, the area used for garden walls and used for uh, various uh, locations around the area. The Drimna houses, the Drimna that we know today, uh, it all links back to 1930 to to try and clear the overcrowded inner city housing. It was a very ambitious social housing programme. And going by the research that's been carried out by UCD, a third of all Irish house building was social housing um, between the years of 1932 and 1950. An amazing achievement for this country. And uh, the Drimna Farmland and the Brickworks Company uh, were all to be new houses built up and the lead up to the emergency. So in and around the Second World War time, uh, this made our building materials scarce and expensive. So they sourced some locally, as we saw with the Dolphins Farm Brick. Um, and they were primarily parlour houses. So you had a separate room in the house where children could study or where you could uh, get away from the rest of the house. Busy, busy households, but always a house, a room in the house dedicated to being on your own. Way ahead of their time as well, because many of the houses in the Drimna area have gardens that are large enough to grow your own. So we're, we're going back to that idea now, but Drimna is ahead of the time. All of the houses, the schools and the church were all completed ahead of schedule. I mean, it is a phenomenal development. And um, in the 1950s, the beginning of tenant purchase, the beginning of being able to buy out the house you were living in. This is long before it came into vogue in the United Kingdom. In the late 1970s, we had another system of surrender grants. You actually got an opportunity if you left your local authority house, you would get a grant towards buying your own elsewhere. And by the 1980s or thereabouts, two thirds of nearly of the original local authority homes had been sold on to tenants. And that would be a similar figure, probably a bit higher even today. And it just fits in with the Irish psyche, where home ownership in Ireland was one of the highest in Western Europe at the time. It's just a, an interesting commentary on the way we approach housing. Now, I mentioned earlier to hold the image of Drimna from the air in your mind, because believe it or not, when they built Drimna, they built it to a plan. And the original plan was to try and recreate the tower brooch in housing. So in Crumlin, they recreated a Celtic pattern for the houses in Crumlin and named the roads after the diocese and holy sites of Ireland. So Kildare Road, Monastery Voice and whatever. But in Drimna, we went the other way and we were thinking of recreating the Tara brooch. Now it worked to a certain extent, but it wasn't completely successful because Drimna was built in two parts. So somewhere within that is a Tara brooch image. That's the original map that I had put up at the beginning. But it's just that Drimna, the second part of it was built by the Associated Property Housing up further near the um. Uh, the, uh, the Our Lady's uh, Children's Hospital. So we lost the pattern slightly, but it was meant to be a tower brooch from the air. Just one of those little quirky things about uh, Drimna. But if we were to look at the housing in Drimna, just to do a very quick run through, let's have a look and see what Archie Seek, this great company, but the, the, this website, they give us a, a nice description of the housing in Drimna. And their, in their opinion, the houses of Drimna 
are modernist in style, they're streamlined and cut to a line, and they're bold building structures and that most people go for a simple paint cutter. The distinctive brand band running across the middle of the house around the doors and windows makes them different to those in other areas, and the door cases are particularly elegant. Um, they have a mixture of terrace and semi-detached houses, which are mainly put at the corners, and some of them have a red brick treatment at lower level. And I love the commentary on the garden walls and the gate piers describing them as distinctive. And here's some of them. It's hard to get the original images, but this is again some that I found in the city archive. Uh, Drumna does have a style of its own. Uh, certainly the door casing is quite unusual. So many of them had that uh, porch cover over the door. Uh, in other areas, you only got that at random houses, maybe at the beginning and the end. I'm sure some of you recognize the old uh, shop. Uh, again, behind that wall is the uh, Lansdowne Valley. Uh, houses have been built along this route in more recent years. Again, in other parts up around Lizardell, uh, around the doors are completely different. And this is, of course, part of the private housing development that took place up near Crumlin. Um, again, you get this wonderful mixture of houses in Drimna. Uh, we have a, quite a mix. In fact, the cottages on Rafters Road, the Morrow Creek cottages that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Ivy Gardens technically are in Drimna. They back into it, they back onto uh, the Brickfield Road. We've got the private ones I've just mentioned there around Lizardale. Uh, the variety of apartments that have appeared around Galtimore and Schlieve Bloom and the 1,500 houses that were built by the Associated Property Company. And then, of course, in Carroll Road, we have the more recent new houses that have been built. Drimna has a style, a shape of its own, uh, certainly uh, airy, built with the idea of giving people space, space to thrive, having that separate room in the house, the parlour room, uh, and room to survive in a time when we were looking at a, a similar situation, what we have now, the, the difficulties of TB, this is when Drimna was built. So it's built with that sense of space and movement and large gardens, which allowed people to grow fresh fruit and vegetables, which were important to your welfare and your care. The houses are a wonderful, wonderful mix in the area. And then just to uh, work around, finally, our, our place names, uh, the mountains of Ireland, well, yes, if you really want to learn them, just get your map of Drimna. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, all around Drimna, we've all of the mountains and the peaks of Ireland uh, commemorated. Uh, Eric Gall and Cooley being uh, important up around the Children's Hospital, but all around um, uh, Drimna, the roads are commemorating the mountains. I've left out a few, couldn't fit them all in, but you get the general idea. The exceptions, of course, are those that carry the name Brickfield, Ivy, the Rafters, which was originally the, the landowners, Davitt commemorating Michael Davitt, Herberton related to the bridge on the canal, and of course Crumlin Road related to the village of Crumlin further up. Hope you've enjoyed the talk tonight. Um, before we finish, I just want to say a very special thank you to Kate Chandler in the Dublin City uh, Culture Connects Company. Uh, to Donald, who's my moderator tonight. I hope I haven't made it too hard for you, Donald. And to Thomas, uh, who was working away in the background, making sure all the tech work. Uh, and thank you all for joining. And maybe now we'll have a look at the chat and the questions and see if anything popped up. But thank you very much for joining us tonight. Brilliant, Cathy. Thanks so much um, for that. There's a great Dublin band called uh, A Lazarus Soul, and, and they have a line in one of their songs, local is knowing where the gap in the fence is, but <laughs> Cathy knows who built the fence, you know? <laughs> That's an, just an incredible level of, of, of knowledge that you have. And I'm actually going to go out there uh, in the next day or two to see that point on, on, on Brickfield Drive and the Crumlin Road. What a lovely little accidental memorial uh, to, yeah. to local labour history. Uh, that was fantastic. A couple of questions came in, uh, just two. Uh, if you have one, now is the time to ask it. Uh, David asks about any connection to the Dolphin Football Club that you might know of in the area. 
Oh, that's a great one. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's lots of um, sport is huge. I mean, we didn't even touch on uh, the boxing clubs and all that. That's a, a talk for another day if we were to bring it right up to the present day. Uh, yeah, the Dolphin Football Club, we're located, and I think this is where we get Dolphin Park from as well on the Crumlin Road, but it's more it's more down in the Dolphin's Barn area. Um, not really that active today, more Rialto Football Club uh, will be the one we have today um don't know too much about it but i'd be more than willing to learn and uh, if anyone has anything to share in it sure now is the time to get it out there and the great brian cares and he connected to the area too yes, brian, yes. Right? yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have a lot of them there's so many i mean you could do it you do it from that point of view as well what i was trying to do tonight is dig back and show the moving Drimna and Brilliant. what it evolved and then we can take the people from there on. Now here's a good question Margaret, can a protection order be put on the wall? <laughs> uh, well done Margaret um, let's start a campaign because we were concerned uh, somebody put a planning permission up on it there not that long ago and drilled into the bricks, I mean I nearly had a heart attack oh. because those curved bricks cannot be got and yeah. they are a really rare uh, item um, you know, Max Salvage rarely have them. You will get a Dolphus Barn brick, but you will struggle to get the curved one. And so we have a wall with them in it. Um, and I, oh, I was really upset when I saw the planning application going in and being drilled into the brick. I mean, you know, don't do that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so maybe, maybe it's something we should really play up because it's it's a very important. You you pass it by feature. But it has a whole meaning and a whole backstory that is really the foundation of Drimna. Without the brick fields, we wouldn't have had the site that mm. Drimna was ultimately built on. Uh, yeah. A logistical question. What's the best Lewis stop to get to Drimna Castle? Oh, right. The one in Bluebell is probably the best. Mm. And there is a way through. Uh, it's a small little industrial estate and a pathway then that brings you in around the back of Lansdowne Valley and you come out at what was the coconut uh, shop and you're right at Drimna Castle there. So it will be the one at Lansdowne Valley. The one further on, Kylemore, is much too far. Um, it's a bit of a, a trawl back. So I would go Lansdowne Valley. I probably wouldn't walk it late at night uh, without having... Um, maybe a dog for company and a flashlight. Uh, I don't know what the lighting is like, but um, definitely during the day, uh, the one at Bluebell, great little walk through, uh, through, which brings you through the apartment block and you can cut around then towards the castle itself. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. And just the, the last one before we cut off, Barbara asked, uh, thanks, that was wonderful. Can I watch it again? You can watch it again. Yeah. Uh, all these talks go up on our channel. So YouTube and the like, uh, give us a little bit of time and you'll be able to watch Cathy's great talk back there. But yeah, all that remains for me to do is thank everyone who tuned in. Uh, it's nice, as uh, we were chatting before we came on, me and Cathy, about how you can have more people at these talks. And when you miss the connection of being in a room together, it is it is nice that more of us uh, can enjoy these things together. And undoubtedly, Cathy has many, many, many more talks on local history coming up. So uh, do keep up with the, the Dublin City Council historians and residents. It's a great uh, initiative. It's spread across the country into other uh, local authorities. Uh, it said Dublin County Council has Liz Gillis now too. I'll also keep an eye over her talks. And it's, it's just great to have historians working in, in communities. So there'll be a lot more from Cathy uh, in the weeks, months and years ahead. But we'll, we'll leave it there for now. And uh, thank you, Cathy. And until next time, everyone, Slangafall. Slangafall, Slang, down at Gormacket. Gormacket.